Elton John movies. Is that what the Pope and the Vatican should be using the Peter Pence money for? I don't think so. I'm joined here today with the great, the formidable George Newmeyer. We're going to talk about the uh, blocking, the pausing of the Fulton Sheen beatification. Maybe talk a little bit about the Pope's recent statement on uh, what he's added to the magisterium. Uh, so, got a good show today. Great guest, George Newmeyer. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Good. I enjoyed seeing your your clip with with Cardinal Dolan, and we'll try to show that in just a little bit, where you ask him to his face, "Why did you block the beatification of Fulton Sheen?" Before we do that, we'll begin with prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Patre Noster qui est in celi sanctificetum nomen tuum, advenia regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, succut in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut in nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, George. Do you enjoy the Immaculate Conception? I did. I did. Uh, although I, uh, I was working a little bit, you know, as you know, I, um, I, I had been trying for the last three days to get Dolan on the record about why, you know, the role that he played in, uh, blocking the beatification of Fulton Sheen. I had sent emails to his press secretary and I, I even went over to the chancery on Thursday and tried to, you know, talk to his press secretary directly. But of course they, um, they treated me like a leper and, and, um, you know, they, they were not going to even, um, you know, pay me the small courtesy of simply saying no comment even. So I decided on Sunday that I would go over to St. Patrick's cathedral. And, uh, I know that every time that Dolan's in town, he says the ten fifteen, and I figured, uh, uh, that after mass, I might have a chance to ask him a question. And, uh, it just so happened, uh, that I, I was able to ask him why he blocked the beatification of, of Fulton Sheen. And if he, of course, um, wasn't uh, straightforward with me, he denied it and said, I, d I didn't block it. But as we know from uh, Bishop Montano's uh, letter or his letters uh, in which he said that he consulted with New York about uh, this matter, we know that, that Dolan played a role in suspending the beatification of Fulton Sheen. That's not even in question. So I don't know. I don't know why Dolan felt the need to lie to me and just say I didn't play any. You know, I didn't block it. He, he of course blocked it. Yeah. And right. uh, you want to show the clip? Sure. Let me see if I can put the clip up here for everybody at home. So let's see here. Okay. So uh, this is. Uh, I get this is at St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's at St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's the ten. It's at the end of the ten fifteen mass. Uh, it's, it's the very it's the procession where uh, where Dolan schmoozes everybody as he's leaving the church. So I, I felt like it's a it's an it's a um, an acceptable time to ask him a question. And and was this uh, was this at the high altar or the side altar, Guadalupe? Where where did this? Where was he saying mass? Uh, he was saying it at the high altar. High altar. Okay. All right. I'm going to run it here. Hopefully, everybody can hear it at home. the beatification of Fulton Sheen? I did. Let's we'll see that again real quick. Beatification of Fulton Sheen? I did. Okay. Did you think he know, knew it was you? Did he recognize you? I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I've, I've talked to him once before. Uh, I don't know. He, um, yeah. He knows who you are. I, yeah, he must know who I am. Yeah, I, I think so. But uh, I'm surprised, you know, he, at least he answered the question. You know, sometimes yeah. he's got to answer the question. But it's good to get him on the record because, you know, no, no, nobody nobody else. I mean, we, we haven't heard anything from the, the principals who who uh, are responsible for this decision. We haven't heard from Supich. You know, Supich hasn't said a word about this. And Dolan hadn't said a word about this. The only person who said anything about it is Montano. And and he, you know, he's said that through a letter or letters. But he, you know, it's good to get these guys on, on tape. Uh, 
you know, declaring uh, one way or another whether they participated in this um, derailment of the Sheen beatification. So my question is, where are the other reporters? You know, where are, where are the John Allens? You know, why aren't they... Why aren't they doing this work? Why aren't they going up to Dolan? Because at least they, I mean, they have access. You know, Dolan isn't going to stiff arm a John Allen, you know. Well, he, that's he, why they have that, access, because they don't ask the hard questions. Yeah, I guess that's what it comes down to. But, I, you know, in these situations where you want these guys to talk, you basically need a, a media scrum. Like, it, it can't just be one guy. It's got to be like five, six, seven reporters. Yeah. You know, if, if seven reporters after mass went up to Dolan and said, hey, why didn't you block the application of Fulton Sheen? He'd have to stop and talk about it for like five to, five to ten minutes. But if it's just one person like me, I can get one question in, and then he can just lie and say, oh, I didn't, I didn't block it, and then move on. So, but, you know, that's better than nothing, I think, uh, especially when, you know, it's going to come to light, uh, all the machinations uh, behind this uh, uh, derailment of the beatification. It's gonna. We're gonna find out exactly over time. We'll find out exactly how this went down. And and Dolan, it'll come out that Dolan played a major role in stopping this. Well, even the fact that that he wouldn't allow the body to be transferred was right. a major obstacle. Correct me right. if I'm wrong. Yeah, that was you know because Peoria had said. You know, if we don't have a body, we're not going to go forward with the cause. You know, you know right. what's the point of, you know, we, if, if you know we we're supposed to do everything for the cause and then not have the a shrine to Fulton Sheen, not have his body. You know, and the, and also uh, the scuttlebutt, or I don't even think it's scuttlebutt. I think it's fact. Uh, Egan, you know, the predecessor of Dolan, uh, Cardinal Edward Egan, had made an agreement with Peoria. He said, if you guys push the cause, I will give you the body. And uh, and Dolan wel welched on that agreement. And so it's very easy to interpret Dolan's behavior here as uh, basically just uh, sour grapes, you know, that he uh, he uh, was uh, antagonistic towards towards all the folks in Peoria who were pushing this cause. Yeah, before we get into to Elton John movies and all this nonsense. It seems to me that if America had, I don't know, let's say, let's say America didn't trust postal workers, people who carry the mail at your door, you would think that the postal workers would want there to be a canonized saint who was a postal worker, kind of give them some creds like, hey, look, we got our own saint. Right now, the U.S. bishops have the worst PR problem ever. Nobody trusts a United States bishop. Everybody thinks that they're lying, they're cheating, they're covering up predators, uh, financial misdeeds. So you would think at this moment of crisis, late 2019, they would be like, yeah, let's just get one of our boys canonized, you know, at least then we got a saint, you know. But no, they don't want no. Fulton Sheen to be their, their canonized saint. No, no, they, um, in fact, yeah, I, I would argue that they're, basically turning uh, Sheen into a sacrificial lamb for their own sins. You know, they're, they're making Sheen pay for their own, for their own derelictions of duty. And, and they're trying to, you know, basically they see the attorney general's bus headed towards them and they want to stop it by throwing Fulton Sheen underneath it. And it's, it's, it's appalling uh, because Sheen, I mean, Sheen was Bishop of Rochester for, for three years, you know, 1966 to 1969. How many cases could he possibly have bungled? You know, I mean, it, it just, you know, he had, he, he barely got there before he left, you know? And so the idea that he is somehow the poster boy of covering up abuse is a joke. And, and we've, we've seen no evidence so far from any of the people involved, including Montano, that he even mishandled one case, let alone multiple cases. You know, show us the evidence of that at least. But e but as we could, as we've seen with uh, the canonization of John Paul II, that's obviously not an impediment. You know, having mishandled an abuse case is not an impediment to becoming a saint under this pontificate. So why why are there uh, why are there these double standards uh, with respect to, to Fulton Sheen? Why 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 is he sub suddenly subjected? to this very, very high standard of having handled every case perfectly. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to see Montano and all these kind of voices in the background that are insinuating 
that there are other cases out there that she'd screwed up, you know, show us those cases. You know, th they've had, uh, Rochester has had how many years to look to examine the files with respect to Fulton Sheen? They've had years and years and years to do that. They know all the cases that he would have handled. Why are they being so um, mysterious and vague about this? And, what, you know, it, it, it all to me, it looks just like um, uh, a big smear of, of Sheen, you know? And uh, But at, at the very least, I mean, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that he did mishandle a case. I'm, I'm willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads, but nobody's supplying us with that evidence. And we're supposed to be waiting for this a left wing hack attorney general in New York city who's endorsed by the NAACP and the national organization for women. We're supposed to wait for her to let us know whether or not Fulton Sheen is a saint. You know, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, we all know why they want to block this. A he's an enemy. Fulton Sheen is an enemy of Spellman and Spellman is the granddaddy spiritually and, and, in all other ways, of Theodore McCarrick. There is a apostolic succession of right. all this perversion. I shouldn't use the word apostolic. There's a there's a perverted succession in the United States hierarchy, and Spellman is is where a lot of the rot derives from. And we know that Fulton Sheen and Spellman originally, I, I understand, were were close and friends, but there was a falling out. And Fulton Sheen was always, you know, locked horns with Spellman. And Theodore McCarrick and everyone who descends from Theodore McCarrick's influence, and that includes Donald Wuerl, that includes Blaise Supich, that includes basically everyone who has a red hat, Tobin, all right, all these guys. And then Dolan, who's in New York, kind of has to preserve this legacy. These guys are not going to allow this guy right here, Fulton Sheen, to be the Bishop Saint of the United States of America. Also, Fulton Sheen was against communism. And currently, right. you know, the the candy of the day in the church is communism. This is what right. the bishops and the pontificate want to promote. Look at China, if you don't believe me. Look at China. Who And who brokered that deal in China? Theodore McCarrick. So this right. is why they don't. And also, Fulton Sheen said, hey, the episcopate and the clergy will be corrupt. There will come a time when the laity have to sort this out, which is right. exactly what's happening in 2019. They don't want Fulton Sheen. Right. Yeah. And and Sheen also gives off an odor in their view of the pre Vatican II church, the, you know, the American church of the Baltimore Catechism. He gives off too strong an odor of that for that for their taste. And and that's I think another reason why they, they didn't want him to become a saint is that he represents the very American Catholicism that they're trying to stamp out, you know. And uh, they don't want, you know, they, they don't want a bunch of bishops to look to Phil Fulton Sheen as a model. That's the last thing they want. Yeah. Um, they want, you know, they, they want people to think that Tobin and Supich and Whirl are models of good Episcopal governance and good Episcopal teaching. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, there's a, a huge element of, I think, jealousy at work here. And, and uh, as you're saying, you know, we are seeing sort of the mischief of, Cardinal Spellman's grand nephews, you know, if, the, if, if these guys are the nephews of McCarrick, they're the grand nephews of Spellman. And uh, yeah, Spellman hated, uh, Sp Spellman went out of his way to, uh, to try to damage the career of Sheen. He took him off the air, you know, he made sure that he wasn't on TV anymore. He wouldn't let him, uh, he wouldn't even let Fulton Sheen preach at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral for many years. And then he exiled him to Rochester, made sure that he was exiled to Rochester which is, you know, for a New Yorker at Rochester looks like Siberia, you know? Um, and it's not surprising to me that she, you know, only, only lasted there for three years because it, it really was a very undesirable assignment, particularly at that time when the church was completely coming apart. And, and she was actually uh, much more effective and, and much more used to the church as, as a uh, kind of freelancing bishop who was going around the country and around the world teaching the faith and he really wasn't well suited to be a bishop in the first place. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think what you said is true that, yeah, he's, he, he's too anti-communist to be a saint under this pontificate. He's too pre-Vatican II-ish to be a saint under this pontificate. And he's too American in a way to be a saint under this pontificate. We know that 
Francis has an antipathy towards Americans. He doesn't particularly like Americans. You know, he uh, he has a kind of anti-Yankee uh, mindset that's very typical of Ar Argentine leftists. And uh, I'm sure that's affected, uh, colored his view of whether or not the Sheen beatification should go forward. One of the, one of the things I've noticed in all the coverage is that um, – the, the Pope is kept completely out of the coverage. You know, the blame is placed on Paroline, that Paroline, oh, Paroline made the decision to pull the plug on the beatification. Well, give me a break. I mean, you know, uh, nothing happens at the Vatican without the without Francis's approval. So anything that Paroline did, he does with the approval of, of Francis. So this was Francis uh, killing, the, killing the canonization of Sheen because a bunch of American cardinals who have his ear, like Supich and and uh, and I guess Dolan to a certain extent. I mean, two weeks ago, Dolan and Matano and all the New York bishops were over in Rome for an ad limina visit. And yeah. do we really think that during that period they weren't whispering to Paroline and to Francis and to everybody at the Vatican, "Hey, we got to stop this Sheen beatification." I mean, the the question I the question I'd like answered is. Who set the date in the first place? Who who in uh, the office of the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints set the date in the first place? Who's that figure? I mean, there must be some sort of, you know, people are working, must be working at cross purposes at the Vatican for the date to have even been set. But I'd like to know who is that figure and what does he think of what's happening right now? You know, but of course, we're not going to get any reporting on that because the John Allens and... Um, uh, are, who are over there in Rome? They're never gonna. They're not gonna do that kind of reporting. No. So. You like Lord of the Rings, George? I, you know, I have to say that I'm not. Uh, I, I don't follow that very closely. So, okay. I, all right. Well, I there's this I'm cool gonna... scene in Lord of the Rings where, in the film, where Gandalf the Grey, he's talking to Saruman the Wise, the two wizards, and then there's this point where in this tower, and Gandalf realizes Saruman's evil. There's this moment where you see Gandalf's eyes kind of like wide now, and he's like, oh, man, this guy betrayed me, and he's the guy behind all the evil in yeah. the whole Lord of the Rings universe. And I always imagine that this is the parallel between Fulton Sheen and Spellman. You know, they're like hanging out one day, and then some ceremony, or Spellman says something, and Gandalf says, oh, snap, Spellman's <laughs> the bad guy. You know, and this, uh -huh. and this initiates all these epic fights and controversy between – these two men who are, you know, leaders, and yet they realize they're on the different side of the moral debate for their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and so in this in this story, that makes Fulton Sheen the Gandalf, right? He's the yeah. one who's trying to do the right thing, but he's being undercut by his own confreres. Right, right, yeah, and uh, yeah. He's had I, to do a little Lord of the Rings, and they hadn't done it in a while. I think yeah, there's there are going to be some very interesting backstories about that about that rivalry that are going to come out in the next few years. Uh, I know, I know that people are one guy is one gentleman is working on a book about this, and uh, he has some explosive material and which he's uh, talked with me about, and I, I don't feel like I can share it, but it's it does not reflect well on Spellman. And it, it may not, you know, there are, there were times, I guess, when, um, you know, Sheen did did uh, hit Spellman pretty hard. Um, I guess there, you know, there's uh, back and forth in terms of letters that I guess uh, don't don't make either of the figures look all that great. But uh, Sheen, I think, didn't Sheen at the end of his life in uh, in the that book, The Treasure of Clay, didn't he talk sort of generally about how he wished he had handled certain situations better and, and with, you know, he was kind of insinuate, uh, making uh, oblique reference to the Spellman situation. Yes. So, I, think, I mean, in, I speculate, this is speculation. This is not facts, but I think there are some facts that point to this, you know, Fulton Sheen helped bring Bella Dodd back to the faith. Yeah. And I cover this in my book infiltration. It's like page 83 to 86. Uh, I think it's around there, but he helped bring Bella Dodd. Now, Bella Dodd said that there were a number of high up clergy that were working for the communists that were infiltrators 
including those who had red hats. They told this to Dietrich von, Bilder, von Hildebrand and his wife. And so if you read Infiltration, I, I'm, I'm very careful about it. I don't come out and say it, but I do sort of suggest that perhaps maybe Spellman might be one of these, just because of what we know later about McCarrick and, uh, and Bernadine and, and other things that were going on in the country. We also know that Fulton Sheen told Belladad not to release names. And a lot of right. people have wondered why on earth would, full, if the church had been infiltrated all the way up to red hats, cardinals in the U.S., why wouldn't Fulton Sheen want to expose this? We don't know, but maybe it goes back to this rivalry between Spellman and Sheen, and maybe, maybe Sheen didn't want it known for some reason. I don't know the facts, but there's a lot of things going on there with Bella Dodd, Sheen, Spellman. That story has not been told yet. Yeah, and we don't even, yeah, I mean, I would like to know to what extent Sheen's knowledge of the homosexual subculture, which which uh, Spellman was was quietly fostering within the church. I, I, I wonder how much Sheen knew about that and how much that played into Sheen's willingness to take on Spellman and, and to, to fight with him, you know, because, uh, you know, we know... <laughs> I mean, the comments that you referenced earlier about, you know, that Sheen made about um, that the church is going to be hijacked by her own clergy, by the by yeah. all these traitors within the highest ranks of the clergy, and that the laity will end up having to to wrest the church away from these uh, frauds and imposters. Uh, there's no doubt that Sheen, you know, was drawing upon his own knowledge of uh, the, the filth within ecclesiastical life and all the heresy within ecclesiastical life. So, yeah. But another, that, yeah, you know, another it, interesting it, story would be to, to find out if Sheen, if he ever, if there's any recorded interaction between him and McCarrick, I would love anyone out there, all you journalists and scholars, let's look into this. Is there any interaction between Sheen and McCarrick? I know there's interactions between Spellman and, and McCarrick and Spellman and Sheen, but I'd love to see how all this was ha was was happening, how this was shaken out in the seventies and you know before. Right? When did Sheen right. die? I used to know. Uh, I'm guessing late. Was it the late uh, early eighties or, no, or uh, think... was it later than that? I thought it was like seventy nine. Okay. Yeah, I don't People know. In the comments, tell us. Yeah. Here I'm looking it up. There's that. There's a famous picture of uh, which uh, I find very edifying. There's a picture of John Paul II hugging an elderly Fulton Sheen, and it's a yes. it's a very poignant picture because you can see on Sheen's face, you know, all the all the anxieties, all the tribulations that he had to endure, you know, over the course of a long ecclesiastical career, and and John Paul II was hugging him. You know, maybe maybe as if to say, you know, we understand each other. You know, we understand the, uh, the you know, this is a this is a pretty tough time in the, in the in the history of the church for a churchman to to try and keep try and keep the faith. You know, yeah. and, and uphold the faith. And uh, so, um, all right, I got his death here. It's uh, 1979. Okay. Oh, oh. Oh, December 9th, 1979. So today. Okay. We're recording this December 9th, 79. So this is 2019. So this is, this is, uh, what is that? 40 years? Yeah. Today is the 40 year anniversary of Fulton Sheen's death. How about that? Yeah. So he died right. So there was John Paul one. He was murdered. I mean, he died. And then there's John Paul II, and then he and then Fulton Sheen died early on in John Paul II's pontificate yeah. within within months. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Fulton Sheen saw none of the '80s. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of the '70s and the '80s and a bunch of oddities, let's talk about Elton John. Okay. <laughs> I never thought on this show I'd ever be talking about Elton John. And unfortunately, the Vatican has forced me to talk about Elton John because they dropped some money into the biopic about Elton John called Rocket Man. I haven't seen the film. 
no surprise. But apparently they, they dropped some money in this. What do you know about this, George? Well, the story is that um, the money that the Vatican put put into this this uh, this outrageous and I guess obscene movie, uh, I guess it originated with Peter's Pence, right? That it was yeah. it was money that the faithful have given to the Vatican on the assumption that it's going to go to papal charities that are real charities. Yeah, the, to go to the poor and. Um, and so instead, the money apparently ended up in a in a Maltese investment firm, you know that uh, the person running the Maltese investment firm, I guess, was friends with folks in the uh, Paralene's office, Secretary of State's office, and uh, they got uh, millions of dollars for various movies that that the investment firm was uh, financing. One of which was this. Uh, you know, semi-pornographic or pornographic Elton John biopic, right? And and um, has a sex scene it, with two dudes in it. Yeah, which I guess, yeah, the uh, and, and I guess a bunch of countries, Russia, Malaysia, a bunch of Middle Eastern countries, have cut that scene out of the movie, you know, because it's too pornographic. And um, so, at any rate, but <laughs> one of the ironies here is that after the church put the money into this movie through this Maltese investment firm they ended up losing losing money on the movie so it's an, it's an example of how uh, even in a worldly sense how hapless this vatican is you know they uh they they, they can't even uh, make money off porn apparently you know and yeah. this is not the this is uh this isn't the first time the uh the church has has done this kind of thing don't you remember maybe is that five ten years ago the germans Remember the German bishops were investing in a publishing house in Germany? Yes, I remember this. That the publishing house was producing pornography? Yeah, they were they were doing all of these um if I remember the story correctly, these uh romance novels, but they have all of this, you know, the stories all about, you know, pornographic, you know, adulterous fornication, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this, <laughs> so this that uh that came to mind, but also another thing came to mind which is Observatory Romano under uh, this pope has been producing these these really bizarre obituaries about non-Catholic figures, uh, these celebrities, and and they've done two at least two that are just abs absolutely ridiculous. One was on Michael Jackson, which was a very laudatory, and then another was which was also equally laudatory was one on David Bowie. And uh, so I can only imagine uh, the ob obit, the Observatory Romano is going to roll out when Elton John dies. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's particularly farcical that this sort of thing is happening with this Vatican because this Vatican is going around telling all of the religious orders and all the uh, dioceses around the world, you need to make sure that you're not investing in Exxon and Mobil and yeah. you're not investing in right. oil companies and, and you're not giving money to gun man manufacturers. And so while they're saying that they're putting money into a, into a pornographic Elton John biopic. Yeah. yeah. And also this whole idea, like you wrote, you know, writing the obituaries of Michael Jackson and whatnot and David Bowie, this is, it's incredible. I mean, we saw during the dubia crisis, I guess we're still in the dubia crisis, but, the Dubia Fathers Cardinals couldn't meet with Pope Francis. They were asking and begging for a meeting to discuss the Dubia regarding Amoris. Couldn't get in. And then you see, you know, Bono from U2, the band. Oh, yeah. Who, by the way, yeah. publicly dedicated a song to Theodore McCarrick. I think I showed the footage once on this show. I don't have it right now. Yeah, yeah, that's Bono right. sang a song and dedicated it to Theodore McCarrick on stage. Right. Bono right. gets to stroll in and hang out with the Pope. Leonardo right. DiCaprio, he gets yeah. to chill with the Pope. Cardinal Burke, his eminence, no tickets for him. No, yeah. What's the deal? <laughs> yeah, didn't um, didn't you uh, two perform in the Sistine Chapel, which was the first time a rock band had ever performed in the Sistine Chapel, and and uh, that was considered to be you know oh no big deal and uh, that's okay and you know we we we're, we need to. Uh, you know, make the Vatican a much more casual place and all this stuff. But when you go to Rome now, as you, you know, as you'd probably remember, it's like, it, it, 
you, you don't feel if you're a normal, ordinary pilgrim, Catholic pilgrim, you don't feel welcome at the Vatican. You no. know, you 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 know, good good luck trying to get to, into the Sistine Chapel unless you're willing to stand in the museum line for five hours. You know, it, it, it's it's not a place of pilgrimage. It's a it's a it's a quasi religious Disneyland. Yeah, when you uh -huh. go into when you go into the Sistine Chapel, I was last time I was there like two years ago, maybe three years ago. It is just people pushing you to the doors, and there's this Italian gentleman every three seconds that yo no photo, no photo, <laughs> over and over. I'm like, I don't think anyone's taking a photo in here because you're yelling at so much, but they just keep saying no photo. It's like you you couldn't pray a Hail Mary in there if you tried. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, so ridiculous and the yeah. museums they're putting i've heard that the museums are one of the ways that the vatican's actually in the black they make so much money on the vatican museum yeah but there's so many people i remember being you know moving through one of the halls there were there's no air conditioning in there i'm sweating everyone around me is sweating all these sweaty people are pushing and we're all packed and we're just kind of taking baby steps and moving you can't stop and look at anything you're just sort of moving yeah. along hoping that in the next room you can you know get away from other people's bodies and take a breath it's horrible yeah. it's really horrible yeah. yeah it's the least to me it's it was the, one of the least spiritually edifying experiences uh to go to the vatican you know because it, it first you know the saint peter's square now feels like the un you know like the united nations plaza in new york city it's got that uh yeah hideous statue, uh, uh, which is a tribute to illegal immigration. And that, so that's marring the, uh, the overall atmosphere of the, you know, the Bernini arms, you know, which might as well be renamed the George Soros arms, yeah. uh, because it's just, it's, it's not, it doesn't look like a holy place anymore. It looks like, a a, a, a like the UN Plaza or, um, a kind of religious Disneyland, a quasi religious Disneyland. And there's no there's no atmosphere of reverence whatsoever. But you know when you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, you know people are uh, treat the place like it's a gymnasium or something. Well, I was you know I was in St. Peter's uh, I don't know recently, and I was really surprised that they were running. Two things struck me as new: um, the giant there's this giant street sweeper. It looks like the thing that's uh, at a hockey game that that repaves the ice. What is that thing called? I yeah, know. I know. I know what but you're they talking. Were, about. They were running that, so there's right. thousands of people, and it's just kind of like me, me, me. And there's this there's a guy riding it inside St. Peter during the day. I'm like, I don't know. Couldn't could you maybe run that at night? You know, or after hours? I mean, it's just kind of weird that yeah. the giant street sweeper was, and it's huge, bigger than a truck you know, is, is, is driving around while people are in there trying to pray. And then the other thing that struck me, George, was they put in these LED lights okay, all yeah. over. So when you look up, like let's say you're you're leaving the altar of St. Gregory the Great from the sacristy and you're walking to the door of St. Peter to leave. There's kind of those side transepts or those side aisles, you know, and there's altars in there. If you look up there, there are these glaring LEDs shooting down. And I was like, that's new. That's, you know, that's post Laudato C. They're trying to make some point like, oh, we use LEDs. But man, when Michelangelo designed that place, he did not design it for LED light. It looks bad. Get, right. Get rid of that. Francis, yeah. cancel the LEDs in St. Peter's. No good. Okay, so on this story, not only was it Rocket Man, they put one million euro. Now, this is money, by the way, people. Your grandma was at mass one Sunday, and the priest said, Oh, this is Peter Pence. This is a special second offering for the Pope so that he can give money to the poor and help people. This is his his purse to assist and aid the poor of the world. Peter's Pence. So your grandma said, oh, I want to I want to help that. And she wrote her check and she wrote a twenty dollar offering and put it in the envelope for the second offering for Peter Pence. She was writing a check to fund Rocket Man, or at least partially one million <laughs> euro. And then an additional get this, George, an additional three million euro went to the new Men in Black movie. 
Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> maybe did you, I mean maybe the investors at Rome were like Men in Black? That sounds like uh, Cassocks. Let's invest in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that maybe maybe they thought that one could have been concealed from the faithful by the title, but yeah, uh, right. It, right. It's oh, a, Men in Black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so but you know, you know Christ, the Christian brothers uh, and a lot of orders, it turns out that they make a ton of money off uh, off pornography. And, really? Yeah, uh, the they, Christian they, brothers are pretty bad. They invest in like hotel chains that profit off pornography. And, they, and people will bring this to their attention. And they'll always shrug and say, oh, well, it's all indirect. You know, we're not really directly funding this. We're just funding the company that funds it. But they don't take that attitude when it comes to divesting from coal companies, or or divesting from gun manufacturers, or they they you know in, in that case they are very scrupulous. But when it comes to this stuff, um, they're they're extremely casual and, and uh, they're willing to you know uh, try and make money off off uh, uh, corrupting the hell out of people. Yeah. Uh, it, it also reads that Vatican funds account for two-thirds of the money entrusted to a group called Centurion, making the Catholic Church its largest investor. So there's this group, Centurion, 67% or 66.6% goes to Centurion. And this led to a 4.61% loss in 2018, which amounted to a $2 million or 2 million euro loss. <laughs> last year yeah <laughs> so they're they're investing in this in this firm and you know it's like on judgment day well there's the famous quote that I, of saint thomas more he's like what is it profit uh to gain the world and lose your soul but he says to his friend but to gain whales yeah you know, like you lost your soul to get whales this is like yeah. you lost your soul to invest money in an elton john movie <laughs> and you lost two million euro. <laughs> it's, it's like it's uh, like a double whammy loss, spiritual and yeah. temporal loss. Yeah, this 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 cries out for a, yeah, like a par the parable of the bad steward, yeah. bad and heretical steward. But uh, yeah, it's 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 yeah. But the the ethos at the Vatican is so ridiculously gay. You know, like mm -hmm. the the tonight. I pointed that I uh, noticed in Rome, like if you walk around uh, the gift shops of Rome, all, and including the gift shops that are in buildings owned by the Vatican, you always see this one calendar of uh, uh, the priest of the month. You remember, you know that calendar where oh, the yeah. uh, these these it's a totally gay calendar it's like, where it's, it's like seminary like, pictures of seminary or something. Yeah, yeah. and I, I was I don't know if these are real guys if they're real priests. I some people say no, they're all just models. But the fact that these things are being these cal these uh, uh, priestly hunk of the month calendars are being sold in all these buildings that are owned by the Vatican just tells you how gay the atmosphere at the Vatican is. Yeah, Elton John style. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, so uh, you know, I I've been writing about this. Uh, priest, as you know, the, this corrupt Monsignor in, in Washington, D.C., Walter Rossi. And uh, this guy made a funny comment to me about Walter Rossi's uh, uh, extracurricular activities, um, which uh, he was he was contrasting Rossi with uh, with this heterosexual priest uh, who was on staff at the shrine who was getting a hard time from Rossi. This is some years back. And uh, Rossi really didn't didn't like this heterosexual priest, and um, precisely because he was heterosexual and not homosexual, he probably he probably didn't like him because he he didn't accept his advances or something. But at any rate, one of the funny comments that was made to me about this uh, this rivalry between these two priests was, uh, and the difference between these two priests was, uh, this guy said, "Oh, Father So and So, he goes to baseball games in his free time." Uh, Monsignor Rossi goes to Elton John concerts. <laughs> and uh, so that's really, I mean, that's what we're dealing with here. And we're dealing with a priesthood, with a, an ecclesiastical culture that is just immensely gay. And that's why a far, that's why an, an, an outrage like the Peter's Pence financing an Elton John biopic could happen. It, this wasn't an oversight. This was, you know, somebody at, somebody in Paraline's office had to have been told, Hey, money is going to an Elton John biopic. 
And that person probably just said, oh, that's fine. They're like, you know, sweet. <laughs> Do we get free tickets? <laughs> yeah. Do we get so, to meet Elton? Does this mean we get to meet Elton if we fund the movie? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we are in. We want this. Is there any legal recourse? I mean, these people all over the world gave to a second collection, Peter Pence, and were told one thing, and they were lied to. They, oh, their their right. money went to a movie investment firm that made filthy films. What's the legal recourse? I mean, to oh, yeah. sue the Vatican or sue the Secretary of State? I mean, what is the recourse here? They this is and why isn't the Pope apologizing for this? It's scandalous. Right. Unfortunately, because of the hierarchical, monarchical structure of the church, it's it's almost impossible to sue sue the, the, the higher ups when they uh, when they behave in this manner. Like you know, you'd think you'd think the Papal Foundation at this point would have sued the hell out of the Vatican for just you know ripping them off to the tune of millions of dollars, uh, just so that uh, a, a corrupt hospital could be bailed out, you know, and and uh, and and bad loans from the Vatican could be re, uh, repaid. Uh, but I, as far as I can tell, nobody from the Papal Foundation can sue the Vatican. So really, you know, once you give the money to the church, once you give money to hierarchs. Uh, they can do whatever they want with it. And, yeah, and but if I donate they, money to the local Catholic school and I think it's going to help educate inner city kids because that's what the guy at the dinner told me, and then I find out it was to make a David Bo Bowie film. Yeah. I mean, that's illegal. It, you think, you think, <laughs> uh, you think some of these attorney generals would get around to, uh, to you know, investigating uh, the hierarchs who who uh, behaved in such a derelict manner with respect to the Papal Foundation, like I like, why isn't there why isn't there an Attorney General? Why is the the Attorney General of Pennsylvania going after Donald Worrell and Theodore McCarrick for having lied uh, and, and having you know all these conflicts of interest? You know, when they were talking about when they were doing the vote on the loan and. There, there were all sorts of uh, shenanigans there that I, I would think an attorney general could make a lot of hay out of. But for some reason, nobody's touched that yet. Yep. I, I mean, this. listen, folks, there's uh, 1,928 people watching. If any of you watching this right now ever give one penny to Peter Pence, you're wrong. I can't. I just I, at this point, I don't see how anyone can give one red cent to Peter Pence, to Rome, to the Vatican, or to the USCCB. I mean, oh, yeah. and 97.4% yeah. of the bishops don't even deserve a red cent of everything going on, covering up immorality. And and let's just, and okay, cover up immorality, and then just the constant preaching of heresy and modernism in all these pulpits across America. You know, real Catholicism is not represented. What you hear is, you know, immigration and be nice to people and let's, you know, support the local imam in his new mosque. This is what you hear. It's ridiculous. Yeah. 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 God, God knows how much money has gone from the faithful to that, um, to that UN style temple of, uh, of universal religion and, and, yeah, uh, the Abraham, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know that the the Catholic faithful's money is going to that thing. Yep. So, uh, yeah, we're 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 basically giving money to the church, uh, and the church takes that money, and it, it it uses that money to breed our own destroyers. You know, and and I, I remember I wrote about some t some years back. I wrote about how Cardinal Bernadine who was a molester, you know, James Grine has come out and said that he was molested by Cardinal Bernadine. Cardinal Bernadine paid for the political education of Barack Obama. He was using the faithful's money uh, to send Barack Obama out to an Alinskyite training camp in California in the, uh, in 1980, I believe. And uh, that was, that was money coming straight from the faithful. And so in a very real way in America, the Catholic church was breeding uh, her own destroyer, you know, and, and, and so, and we're seeing this now under this pontificate on a global scale all over the place. Yeah. There was also the, uh, the story that broke earlier, I think it was this month 
in which $200 million was used to buy this player's pad in London. Did you see that one? There oh, yeah, this, yeah. There was this real estate deal, a luxury property that was in the Chelsea district in London. Right. And it was and, 200 million, 200 million Vatican dollars uh, that, that went towards this. And you're just thinking, I don't know if, if St. Peter and St. Paul would have bought that. <laughs> yeah, I think, it, it, and and we've learned that th those apartments were used, were the, uh, the seed of gay orgies. And, uh, Party pad. And for all we, <laughs> for all we know, El Elton John's biopic was probably on in the background. Probably, so. <laughs> they probably, yeah, they probably uh, got rented the uh, the uh, actually maybe got free free access since they invested in it. They could watch Rocket Man uh, while they sat on leopard print sofas and stuff. And that's another investment that we don't even know if the Vatican made money off that uh, right. off that investment. You know, so. They seem to not be very good investors. Maybe they should just go back to preaching the gospel and assisting the poor and not investing money. That's, right. my, that's my personal suggestion to Pope Francis in the Vatican. Stop investing money and use it for missions, building churches in the third world, building real churches in China, and assisting poor people. Feeding poor people. What if instead of $200 million going to a, a, a pimp pad in London... Uh, what if that two hundred million? I don't know. Fed people. Right. <laughs> that would be yeah, good. Well, that's, that, that seems like yeah. The terminus, the terminus of modernism, is that the church not only loses her soul, she even loses her her worldly prestige, and and she becomes uh, a failed institution, even on, even on temporal and worldly terms, uh, like so many others, um, and. Uh, and, you know, like, so we, you know, it's, it's a, a great, you know, metaphor, I guess, for the church that so many of these dioceses across the world are declaring financial bankruptcy. You know, they, they, uh, they, uh, so we're, we're bankrupt, you know, modernism produces a church that's bankrupt spiritually, morally, and, and financially. Yeah. And then we also saw, I mean, speaking of financial scandals, the Amazon Senate in Rome funded in part by the Ford Foundation, which promotes LGBT, LMNOP uh, right. identity, abortion, third world contraception, sterilization, all these things. And yet the Vatican is just like, yes, please give us more money, filthy money, please. <coughs> right, yeah. The same Ford Foundation that built much of Notre Dame. Yeah. Notre Dame was uh, on the payroll of uh, the Ford Foundation under Theodore Hesburgh for years. For Theodore Hesburgh was on the on the board of the Ford Foundation, I believe. And um, so, yeah, we're we're seeing we're seeing the 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 world uh, seep into the church more and more, and and take in many ways take over the church. And yet, at the same time, even in worldly terms, the church is failing. The church the church looks pathetic. And uh, it, it's not, you know, it's it's like the UN itself. I mean, does anybody really have any respect, real respect for the United Nations? You know, so that's what happens when you turn your church Francis. into just like, you, I mean, he has respect for it. But when you turn your church into a branch of the United Nations, the consequence is that it becomes as um, irrelevant in a way as the UN itself. Yeah, they just need to get back to, to what our Lord Jesus Christ said, which was to give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, not make scene, movie scenes with naked people in them. That's not right. what our Lord said in Matthew 25. Yeah. He said, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned. I mean, this is the stuff that we're supposed to be doing to serve our Lord. Yeah, And the Vatican's just not doing it. And the people, I just want to say something here. On social media, people come after me. They come after you, and they're like, "Why are Why are you being mean to Pope Francis?" We're not being mean to Pope Francis, folks. Look at this. You cannot give this a pass. There is no way to say, "Well, somehow this is serving the good. This is somehow serving the gospel." It's impossible. There is there is no way that all of these bad cardinals 
right? And these bad investments and these horrible sex scandals and the financial scandals, and they happen every few weeks, people, globally. Right. right. And if we don't protest these things, we're just going to get more of them. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, the, to a certain extent, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know, so if you if you draw attention to to these outrages, uh, these churchmen will be a little bit more um, circumspect in the future. You know, you're not going to get another you're not going to get another semi pornographic film financed by the Vatican probably for a while because of this uh, uh, exposure on the Elton John uh, film. So that's the value of protesting is that the thing that you protest will probably happen with less frequency after your protest. So yeah, if we they're want not going to, they're not going to do it because they fear the Lord, fear the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. Right. They don't worry about going to hell. They don't believe in hell. They're hoping that everyone goes to hell. If the atheist yeah. they teach is going to go to heaven because he's a nice guy and he helped an old lady one day. Well, then they as cardinals are definitely going to heaven. That's how they see this thing, right? right. And you know what's interesting, George? I bet you, you're up in the Northeast. I bet you there's meetings with big, big wig Democrat party guys smoking cigars and drinking scotch. And they say stuff like, how much does it cost to buy a cardinal? How, right. much, how much do we have to invest to make sure that Cardinal Dolan never mentions the word abortion, contraception, LGBT, gay, homosexual, ever in his career as the Archbishop of New York. How much money does that take? Right. And I think right. someone says, well, if we donated to a school fund and the Met Gala and we did this and we did that, you know, we would pretty much have him locked in at 51% of his donations, of his funding. I think we'd pretty much buy him for that. Okay, well, what's that number? 9.1 million. Like, that's it? We can buy a cardinal for 9.1 million? Done. Make yeah. those donations. And they do the same thing now with the Pope. Oh, yeah. How much does it yeah. cost to buy a Pope? Yeah, well, we found out from the uh, the WikiLeaks disclosures, you know, uh, mm -hmm. three, four years ago, how much George Soros invested in lobbying the Pope before his visit to America. He spent like a million dollars to send a 40 lobbyists or so over to the Vatican to have meetings with Meridi Cardinal Meridiaga, the, uh, the, the, who's often like, who's often called the vice Pope. That's how powerful he is. Mm -hmm. And all these lobbyists, the whole point of the meeting, which Soros paid for was to shape, uh, the Pope's visit to America. And they got it. They got what they paid. You know, they got exactly what they paid for. They, the visit to, uh, the Pope's visit to America it involved no uh, distinctive Catholicism whatsoever. He spent all of his time simply talking about politically liberal themes. You know, you could have you could have taken any of his speeches during that visit to America and put it in the mouth of Nancy Pelosi, and nobody would have known the difference. That's right. And so, so that Soros found out from that episode that it only takes about a million dollars to to to. Uh, to determine what a pope talks about during a papal trip to the United States. Yep. Do you think this re is this is this revealing to us, George, that the Vatican is broke, or are they just dumb? I mean, why are they why are they so hungry to get Ford Foundation money and Soros money and Elton John Rocket Man money? Or maybe they just yeah, like these. I, I, I think they have to turn, uh, you know, the more the faithful withhold money from them, uh, the more they have to turn to worldly sources for money. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> as somebody somebody put it, sin, sin and heresy do make people stupid. Yeah. And, uh, and it could be that, you know, these churchmen under the influence of sin and under the influence of heresy – they end up losing their reason, you know. So in a way, the that's another mark of modernism is that you end up with a church that's that that loses both revelation and reason, and uh, and a church like that is bound to end up bankrupt. Uh, yeah. So I think that that's in part what we're seeing. But I, I was going to make a point about you. You had said the value. We were talking about the value of protests hmm. and how, uh, and I thought. This is one of the reasons why I confronted Dolan after mass is that I did not want Dolan 
to leave the 1015 mass. And I didn't want him to go back to his buddies and say, hey, nobody brought up Fulton Sheen. You know, we had a week of Fulton Sheen. We had a a Fulton Sheen controversy for a week. I say the 1015 mass in the biggest city in the United States, and not a single person mentions Fulton Sheen to me. I didn't want to say that when he got back to his buddies. And that's why I went up to him and I said, why did you block the beatification of Fulton Sheen? And Dolan Dolan will remember that. Dolan is going to remember that somebody came up to him at the mass the week, the, the days after the beatification was derailed. Somebody came up to him and said, hey, why did you block the beatification of Fulton Sheen? So that's the value of protest. And I, what I'd say to your viewers is confrontation is absolutely necessary at this point in order to make an impression on these uh, dubious churchmen. You have to confront them. You, you should do it, of course, in a uh, civil and circumspect way. You shouldn't be out, you know, out of control or anything like that. And you should give them no Chuck Norris. Yeah, I mean, you you, you need to be reasonably circumspect and and, and civil. But you, it, I, I see great value in people going up to these churchmen and demanding uh, that they answer fundamental questions about what they're what they're doing to the church. These guys have to be held accountable. And it has to be done in a, in a very concrete way by simply going up to them and asking them. And that, that should be the most natural thing in the world where a shepherd and his flock are one. You know, why, why, why should we have to kiss the ring of, you know, like, like you have to worry about asking a shepherd a question? Why? Right. You know, especially at a time of crisis. You should, the, shep, the flock should be able to get to the shepherd and say, why are you letting this crisis continue? You know, and and I, I so I just don't understand why there aren't more people uh, doing, you know, con- confronting these bad churchmen, because I, I, I really see no solution to uh, the crisis uh, apart from from that kind of approach. You know, the, the approach that you're taking where you're where you're exposing all this through your through your uh, through social media and through your work, you know, by 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 drawing attention to all of this stuff. You're making it. You're 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 making it less likely to happen in the future. Yeah, because again, these men don't fear God. Their biggest worry is they're at a, they're in a recession, and George Newmeyer pops out and said, "Why'd you block the beatification of Fulton Sheen?" Or they're leaving dinner on the Pio Borgo, and then George Newmeyer walks up with the phone and starts asking them questions. Yeah. That's yeah. their worst nightmare. I bet there's so many conversations where they're like, man, I'm just worried that one day I'm going to turn the corner and George Newmeyer is going to be there with his <laughs> iPhone. Speaking of yeah. George, we need to get you like an iPhone hat. I know. I, I'm, I'm technically uh, maladroit. So well, we I need I, you I, to I have some glasses that has like a camera on it. Yeah. So we can I get know. some I, good, I, good shots with the mic. Or maybe you, just, you need like a caddy. You need like a little <laughs> assistant. Yeah, I do. I do. Deacon, and he holds I, a camera, like a small camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I uh, it's pretty. You know, the the quality of the film of the uh, camera angles is always horrible. But for some reason, I often catch. Uh, you get some good stuff. Pretty impressive. I, I catch the, the the principal person saying the thing that is most damning. But so sometimes I, 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 I have it at the right angle, but it's often very wobbly and. And yeah, I'm doing this by myself. And this, I actually, I was uh, uh, astonished that I actually even had a chance to ask uh, Dolan a question yesterday because it was a packed, packed uh, Christmas, you know, season audience, you know, in New York City. And uh, he he comes, I mean, I guess since this is Novus Ordo, second Sunday of Advent, it's perfect. But here he is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He comes within, uh, you know, 10 inches of you. Underfoot. Yeah, he's yeah. right there. Right. And uh, so, but yeah, I, I'm a big believer, even though I'm, I'm very shy, actually, m- most of the time, but I'm a big believer in confrontation as a way to affect change within the church, uh, you know, provided it's peaceful confrontation. And so I, whenever I hear a bad sermon from a, from a priest, I'll go up to him after mass and I'll say, where in the catechism is, uh, you know, you said, you said the following where in the catechism could I find that? Mm-hmm. And they'll start hemming and hawing, or they'll they'll start stuttering, or something like that. And uh, and I and I think to myself, well, I bet at the next mass they're going to delete that line or that paragraph from their sermon. Yep. So I th- I think that this is a way 
for us to reclaim our church uh, through peaceful confrontation. And I, I wouldn't normally advise this, except that we've gone, it's so, you know, things have gotten so bad in the church that we, you know, desperate times call for desperate actions. Yep. Yeah, so everybody out there, you know, you guys have seen Alexander Chaguel, Chuguel, rather, Alexander Chuguel, George Newmeyer. I mean, you guys got iPhones. You have guys got voice re voice recorder on your phone. You've got a video camera. You can you can do this. You can say, uh, Your Excellency, you asked us to give to the CCHD, but it looks like the CCHD is giving, supporting uh, things that don't conform to Catholic teaching. Why did you tell us to vote or give to CCHD? Or are you going to support CCHD in the future? This is not disrespectful. This is not giving anyone the middle finger, right? Yeah. It's just, it's asking a Catholic question to a Catholic leader. And, and we as lay people should know, why did you support CCHD? Why did you support an Elton John film? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see, I'd love to see, you know, even one of the reporters in Rome that we know, like our friends over there, I wish, I wish they could just go up to Paralene and say, mm -hmm. why did you finance, why did you finance this Elton John movie? Yeah. You know, that, that would be a, a very easy interview to, to, um, to, 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 to do. I mean, it, it you know, I, it's very simple. Why did, why did you finance this movie and see what he says? Uh, or, or somebody in Chicago should go up to Supich and say, Hey, why did you support, why did you block the beatification of Fulton Sheen or in, um, or go to Rochester, Montana. Somebody in Rochester needs to go to Montana and say, put up or shut up. You say you insinuate that there are other cases. What other cases? Mm -hmm. You know, spell out the cases that you're talking about. You've had access to the files for 10 years. You know, why, why, why are you being so vague about this? You know, so we need, we, you know, as long as you're asking a question that truly deserves an answer, there's nothing wrong with asking it of a churchman in, in a in a respectful way under the right circumstances. Yeah. I I mean yeah I mean the Elton John one is just that that's one that everybody can see right away like oh yeah he gave money to an Elton John biopic that has a gay sex scene in it. Bad, not good. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they thought like Benny and the Jets was about Pope Benedict. Maybe that's what they thought. <laughs> Yeah. Like candle in the wind. That's that's Catholic. Candles are Catholic. What's another what's another Elton John song? <laughs> candle in the wind. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Crocodile Rock. That's one, right? Crocodile Rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just like I mean, I guess he's got some good jingles or something, but you know, you can't you can't you can't make the movie about Elton John with, with our money. Grandma money. Yeah, yeah. Tiny dancer. <laughs> what is this, man? You know, it's bad, tiny... enough. It's, bad. it's bad enough that we're paying the priestly salaries of guys, <laughs> of, of priests who go off to share concerts and, all, you know, that they're spending their salaries on this nonsense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tiny dancer, and I'm looking at the songs here: Rocket Man, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. I mean, come on, we can't. Come on, Catholic Church, Pope, Vatican, Secretary of the State. We can't, we can't do this, you know. And like you said, it's a, it's like, you know, supporting Cher and Elton John. I mean, it's just, it's campy, gay culture. Let's just be honest about that. Yeah, <laughs> it's just embarrassing. It's embarrassing because. I got Protestant family and friends. I'm trying to like say, man, being Catholic's awesome. The Eucharist, the Blessed Mother, and they're like, yeah, but that Elton John. <laughs> it's like, how do you, how do we respond to this? Right. You know, it's like, well, your Pope sounds like a communist, and they fund Elton John biopics, and you're like, that's a good point. I got no answer for that. And how how do we how do we attract to the priesthood the right candidates? When the when the ecclesiastical culture is so campy and so gay, right. you know, I mean, we, we need to find we need young people to enter the priesthood who are who are capable of making the sacrifice uh, of the priesthood, and that means you need you, you want candidates who are heterosexual who are going to give up that part of their lives for the sake of worshiping God and 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 serving the people of God 
and being a symbol, you know, of the life to come. And uh, you, you can't if, if if a person is incapable of making that sacrifice because they're not not attracted to the to the opposite sex and not attracted to marriage and family life. If they're not capable of making that sacrifice, uh, or even you know feel feel the need to make that sacrifice, you're going to end up with a priesthood that looks like the one we've got right now, which is a priesthood that's you know God knows how you know fifty to sixty percent gay. And, you know, even even somebody as liberal as Wilton Gregory, remember, Wilton Gregory had one moment of candor when he said the priesthood has become a gay profession. And uh, that's, you know, no in order joke. to in order to change that, you, you you have to you have to have an ecclesiastical culture that attracts normal men. And that's certainly not <laughs> that's not what we're getting from this Vatican. We're getting, you know, the gay mafia. Uh, in the church surrounds Pope Francis. I mean, the, 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 this is a this is a Vatican that is owned and operated by the gay mafia. Yep. I got a suggestion for all the vocation directors out there. When a new man comes in, he feels called the priest. To ask him his favorite Elton John song. <laughs> <laughs> if he gives you any correct answer, he's out. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, I just love Tiny Dancer. Yeah, that guy's not <laughs> suitable. Yeah. What do you think, George? Good. Yeah, yeah. Ask Good. them also. Yeah. Ha, ha, have you ever watched a share film? Have you ever been to a share <laughs> right. concert? Uh, right. What's uh, your favorite? If you had to pick going to a share concert or Elton John concert, which would you pick? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's off topic, George. Several years ago, my wife had this inside joke because the song "Tiny Dancer" was on the radio. And somehow I was like either singing it or repeating it back to her. And I was saying, hold me close. I'm trying to dance here. And she said, what are you saying? I said, hold me close. I said the song, hold me close. I'm trying to dance here. She goes, no, honey, it's not trying to dance here. It's hold me close, tiny dancer. I was like, well, what does that mean? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> <It's> just... yeah. <laughs> well, I've always thought it was hold me close. I'm trying to dance here. Uh, but but apparently it's about a tiny dancer. I don't know who the tiny dancer is. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I I think that's a good uh, a good discernment element that should be added to all United States diocesan discernment process. Is there's a question in the in the pre seminary interview? What is your favorite Elton John song? <laughs> And if they're like, oh, it's just so hard to pick. There's Tiny Dancer. There's Rock. You're like, okay. Yeah. Don't yeah. call us. We'll call you. Right. <laughs> but if a guy's like, I don't know. I can't name my own John. I'm like, great. Right. Welcome <laughs> to the seminary. You're yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Well, there it is. Guys, do not give money to Peter's Pence. Do not give money to CCHD. Probably don't give money to anything USCCB related. The Cardinals, we live in a corrupt time period. At le George, at least during the Renaissance, when the popes were spending all this money from indulgences, they were making some pretty good art. Right, right. At least yeah. they were making something good. Yeah. When they, they were embezzling they, money. Now they're making Elton John films, and that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they achieved, you know, these, the Borgia popes, you know, for all their sins, they did, uh, at times have have good worldly taste you know and they were capable of funding worldly excellence in the form of great art so that's more than you can say for this for the uh, the crowd around francis um they're neither they're neither uh impressively spiritual nor impressively worldly uh, so you know yeah. you end up you end up with a church that is you know I, and i think that's that's a consequence of the church losing her mind you know, losing reason and losing revelation, losing her soul. So when you have a, a modernist church, you end up you end up with a church that's at once irrational and and faithless, and uh, that's a pretty scary combination. Yeah. So the way we dig ourselves out is we turn to Jesus and Mary. We can't do this on our own. I mean, this is a supernatural recovery that we need, George. You know, I mean, it's not just like we change some policies. I mean, it's true. We got to ask the questions. We've got to hold our bishops accountable. But man, this is so bad. 
when you got oh, the yeah. Vatican funding gay sex scene and Rocket Man, that's pretty bad. Like we, yeah, we're screwed. Let's question, just be honest, we're screwed. All right. Yeah, and it's a question of it's not a question of grace because we know the grace is there. The question is, are we going to cooperate with that grace? Right. And and for the last fifty years or so or more, the church really hasn't been cooperating with that grace. That's right. And uh, the moment it starts cooperating with that grace, you know, we're going to see great things happen in the church again. Yep. So everybody pray the rosary. Uh, if you if you haven't seen my video on the Advent challenge, watch that. Try to go to Latin Mass on the Sundays of Lent. We've already done two of them, so you got two more to go. Check out the Latin Mass. Pray the rosary. If you haven't been praying the rosary every day, Advent's a great time to get onto that practice to break the beads out. Pray at least five decades every single day. Maybe consider uh, 15 decades on a Sunday. And do some penance. You know, make Fridays a real fast. Don't eat meat. Maybe skip some meals. Correspond with the graces that God is giving us. It's It doesn't just happen by osmosis. God calls for a synergy for our wills to conform to his will. So that's the game plan. Just traditional Catholic practice. Go to Mass, pray the Rosary, read the Bible, fast, do penance, do the novenas. That's it, right? So, okay, George, how can people support you? Oh, they. Uh, I have a GoFundMe uh, account that's available through both Facebook, George Newmeyer Facebook, and uh, and on Twitter. It's it, it, it's linked to on Twitter at uh, at George underscore Newmeyer. And uh, yeah, I'm, your your uh, audience has been tremendously generous towards me, and I I, I uh, am very grateful for that. Well, I I myself, and I know the people that watch this channel, want to get inside information, and you're one of the few journalists who actually will walk up to these cardinals with a phone and ask them the questions. In fact, you might be the only one that actually walks up with the phone and ask them the questions. So. I appreciate you. I love having you on. I love seeing, you know, what you're up to. And every time I see one of these videos, I'm thinking, man, we got to get George on and talk about this. So everyone out there, support G George Newmeyer. There's the GoFundMe page. It will be included in the show notes below this video. So you can just click it. And I am a supporter of George Newmeyer. Uh, I give the man money because no one else in the major media supports him. So if you like the stories he's bringing out, you know, consider giving him a donation. He really appreciates it. And George, thanks for being on. We really appreciate you. Hope you're having a, a happy Advent. And uh, oh, is there anything I, else we can do for you? Oh, no, no. Uh, you've, you've done a tremendous amount for me. I'm very grateful. And uh, thanks a lot for having me on. Great. All right. We're going to close with a, with a Hail Mary. And this Hail Mary is going to be for Our Lady, uh, asking Our Lady to purify the Vatican and the Holy See. Nomini Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or prenobis peccatoribus, nunc et et or mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody, happy Advent. If you haven't clicked the like button, please click the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. I would really appreciate that. Hit notifications all. You'll be notified of the live streams. And also, thank you to everyone who supports on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Dr. Taylor Marshall. I just signed a ton of books this morning, and they're being mailed out uh, as soon as this show's over. So anyone who's supporting on Patreon, you'll be getting autographed free books for me in the days to come. George Newmeyer, thanks for being with us. Appreciate you. Sure. Thanks a lot. We'll, God we'll bless see you. you again soon. Godspeed. Okay.